thank you so much. I want to thank the Margaret Mitchell House for asking me to come. I'm honored to be here. And I want to thank all of you because I know this is Atlanta and there are other things you could be doing tonight. <laughs> um, I've got a lot of friends in the audience, including a surprise visitor. My principal from my <laughs> teaching years is here. I'm just so honored that so many people have come. And I've never done this behind a clear podium. I'm <laughs> so glad I bought these new shoes yesterday. <laughs> I'm going to um, uh, give a little talk instead of just reading from my book, and I've never done that before. I'm a little nervous, so, um, and I, I can't even get away with fidgeting because you can see everything I do. Um, but I'm going to try to give a little talk and maybe do some reading to illustrate my points. Um, the title of my talk could be The Illusion of Fiction. People often ask me, and I find it a very irritating question, I have found it a very irritating question, where do you get your ideas? Where do your ideas come from? And I've always answered that very snappily, saying, well, I think it up. It's fiction. I make it all up. But as I was preparing for this talk tonight, I started looking through the book, and I realize there's very little in here that I made up. <laughs> it's, um, and so I want to acknowledge some of my um, unwitting donors to my fiction tonight. Um, I think one thing that writers do is write about things that they know about in situations in life that they are familiar with. And as I was looking through the book, I realized that lots of these stories have sisters. That's something I'm very familiar with because I do have an older sister. But it was a little disturbing to look through and see that lots of these sisters, the older sister is a very capable, strong woman, and the younger sister often has, seems to have a little mental deficiency. <laughs> so I don't want to delve too deep into my psychology about that. I just noted it. I come from the town of Thomasville, Georgia, one of the most beautiful towns in the state. I don't know if any of you have visited Thomasville, but it, it has always been a beautiful town and is becoming more and more beautiful as they become aware of their charms. And the downtown has been beautifully fixed up. It's a Victorian era town, so the buildings downtown have had these beautiful Victorian facades and brick and marble and granite and brick streets and tree-lined streets and the big oak that we're so proud of. It's almost like a pet of Thomasville. It may not be the biggest oak tree in the state of Georgia, but people in Thomasville don't admit that. It's very big. And um, it, it, I, I have lived there for 50 years and didn't really see its charms when I was younger and wanted to get away and be adventurous, but now I do. And um, from living there all those years, I have a vast accumulation of unnecessary knowledge <laughs> that does come in handy when you write fiction. Um, one, t one time I had some visitors from out of town that's all you have to say in Thomasville. If they're not from Thomasville, it would be California, Michigan. They're out of town. And we, I was showing them downtown Thomasville and how beautiful it is. We were walking up and down the broad street. And there, there's a little set of stairs that goes up between two buildings. And I've always been curious about what was up those stairs, but there's always been a cast iron, a wrought iron gate across the stairway. But on this day, and I think Annie Parker was with me when we did this, we, um, the gate was, the padlock was there, but it was not locked. And it was just about dusk when everybody was gone home for supper. We looked both ways and opened that gate and darted up those stairs. And it, 
it was a little scary because it got darker the higher we went. We knew we were doing something wrong, one. We didn't know what was going to be up there, so we were cautious. Uh, we came to a little dark hallway and turned and went down the hallway and opened a door, and we were in the most beautiful room I've ever seen. Um, I have a, a love for interior spaces, so I tend to write about them, maybe a little, some of my readers say a little too much, but when I found myself in this room, I knew that I would like to write about it someday. It was, you know, the, the, down, the downstairs floor of these old buildings are the stores, and then the upstairs floors used to be something maybe at the turn of the century in the 20s and 30s, but now they're just empty rooms. It had a rift pine floor, beautiful moldings around the doors and windows, and a beautiful pink light was filling the room from the front windows that looked out on Broad Street as the sun set on the, uh, across the street. It shone on the granite uh, storefront across the street and bounced that beautiful light back into this room. It was just a magnificent space up there. So. I knew I wanted to write about that room someday. And I also, at the time that I was thinking up this story, I knew I wanted to have a very nice man in my story, and I knew one. Uh, Thomasville has a very beloved character named Bob Dixon. Everybody in Thomasville loves Bob Dixon, and I don't mind using his real name because he is a public figure. He's a pastor at the Methodist Church and a painter, um, a good painter and, a, and an art teacher. And he's just the most generous, kindest, friendliest, funniest man with a self-deprecating wit that's so appealing. So I... I needed a man like that in my story, so I thought, well, I'll change his name, I'll change a few things about him, and I'll write a story about this man that I needed and the, the room that I liked. I've got a, these are my reading glasses. So I'll read you, this is, this is from the story Almost Gone. Bob Rigsby, changed his name so he'd never be recognized, <laughs> was a distinguished artist. He was a dolphin fellow in the American Watercolor Society. He had been a consultant on the design of the recently issued Longleaf Pine postage stamp, and one of his rose paintings, a Mr. Lincoln, hung in the White House. Plus, he was just such a nice man. What is it that makes people want to feed you, asked Della. All that butter and mayonnaise, said Bob Rigsby, and look at me, I'm already fat. Bob Dixon is not fat. It was the evening after that first session, this is the middle of the story, he's given a, a little painting lesson at a nursing home. It was the evening after that first session, and partly out of gratitude and partly out of curiosity, Della had brought Bob Rigsby supper, the leftover sandwiches, a little salad, and a bottle of wine, and they sat in the front windows of his apartment and looked down on Main Street. Bob Rigsby lived in an interesting place, the upstairs room over what used to be the old Farmers and Merchants Bank building downtown. A hundred years ago, it had been the office of the bank president, but it had stood empty since the 1930s, and it retained that pleasing stillness of places that had been long abandoned. Through the old ripply glass of the tall arched windows and then the lacy leaves of the elm trees shading the sidewalk, they could see the row of handsome brick and granite and cast iron storefronts across the street with their dates arching in gables and pediments, 1882, 1885, 1890. Don't you love mines that are almost gone, said Bob Rigsby. What fascinating little remnants worked their way up out of the clutter of a lifetime of memory. He's talking about the old ladies at the nursing home. 
there was something solid and comforting about the space in that old bank president's office. Its elegant proportions, its thick plaster walls, its grand oak wainscoting and rift pine floor. Della and Bob Rigsby just sat for a while peacefully without talking. The late afternoon light reflected off the white granite building across the street so that for just a minute right at dusk, this room was filled with a filmy pink light. Everything I love is almost gone, said Bob Rigsby. Little towns like this, longleaf pine woods, those old ladies today. Why, even the postage stamp I designed came out just a month before they raised the rates to 37 cents. <laughs> They watched the last light slide up the wall, and then everything was in shadow. Now, the, I wrote that story uh, to be broadcast on the radio on Thanksgiving, and the Friday after Thanksgiving, my phone rang, and it was Bob Dixon. <laughs> I said, Bob, why are you calling me on the telephone? He said, a friend of mine from California called and told me somebody was talking about me on the radio yesterday. <laughs> And he laughed about it. He was very nice about it. So you see, I don't really get away with this fiction sometimes. <laughs> Another um, little inspiration I had was at one of my high school reunions a few years ago. A friend of mine said we were talking about all of our ailments after we'd gotten through talking about the glories of our high school days. And, um, my friend Elaine said she had decided that God does not like women because she was going through menopause, she was raising a rebellious teenage daughter, and she was taking care of her frail and ailing father all at the same time. She said um, that's just too much for God to put on people all at once. So I started thinking about what Elaine had said, and I said, you know, it could be worse. She could be going through menopause. What if that rebellious teenage daughter had had an illegitimate child that she was having to raise? What if the uh, parent was not a father just getting a little feebler, but a mother in the last stages of Alzheimer's? What if she had a mentally deficient sister? <laughs> and, and a very demanding job. <laughs> so um, I took what poor innocent Elaine had told me at our high school reunion and turned it into this. Um, I'm going to start in the middle of the story, but there are two sisters. There's the older, very capable sister, Lucille, <laughs> and the younger sister named Emily, who has never managed to keep a full-time job. And Lucille, the capable sister, has come to check up on Emily. Oh, Emily, said Lucille, look at this. You can't let Mama sit on the upholstered furniture. You have to take her to the bathroom. You know she won't go by herself. And Lord Ned, Ned's the illegitimate grandson. <laughs> Ned, Ned wet too, and we don't even know who peed on who. <laughs> Whom? Whom, whispered Emily. <laughs> Don't whom me, said Lucille. Take this baby. Mama, get up. Stand on this towel. Hold on to the back of this chair. Here I am in the middle of a hot flash, trying to get, <laughs> trying to get my 45-year-old sister her first paying job, throwing out my little girl's breast milk in the microwave and changing <laughs> the diaper on my mama all at the same time. <laughs> There is no God in this world, Emily. If there was, he'd be down here screwing the lid on this sippy cup. Thank, thank you. I, I re we really need to thank Elaine for that. Um, I, I had, when I thought up, was thinking up that story, I had to decide on what the very demanding job would be that that sister had, and um, I went back to my beloved town of Thomasville. When I was growing up in Thomasville, we were told, people from Thomasville, when we went away, we were told, don't say you're from Thomasville, now just say you're from a small town in South Georgia, because if you say you're from Thomasville, it could be perceived as bragging. 
you know, all, every little South Georgia town has its festival. The Climax has a swine festival, and Pavo has a peacock festival, and there's pecan festivals and peanut festivals. Um, and they're usually in the hot summer, and they're just miserable little festivals. But Thomasville, <laughs> Thomasville has a wonderful festival at Christmas next weekend, I think. Y'all should bring some of that Atlanta money down there. Spend it. <laughs> it, uh, it's called Victorian Christmas. The main streets are closed to traffic, and they have horse-drawn carriages and um, music on the corners. They have handbell, the handbell choir from one of the churches and string bands and different kinds of food, and uh, it's just a beautiful event. They, uh, I guess it's the Chamber of Commerce or one of the organizations downtown has a whole warehouse full of Victorian costumes. So everybody's dressed up, and there's no cars. It's just a wonderful event. And I've been to it as a, you know, a, a, a goer, a participant. But I, I started thinking, what, what must it be like to be the one who has to organize that event? What a terrible job that must be to make sure everything's running right so... Uh, I decided that this would be the um, the job that my lady would have in the store. Um, so I had my characters, the feeble-minded sister and the strong s sister with the job, and, and the old mother, and the little illegitimate boy named Ned. But I needed a story to go to fit all these little details in. I had a beloved aunt. You know, our mothers are wonderful, but aunts do something for us that mothers can't always do. And I had a wonderful aunt. She was my father's sister. We had a lot in common because I was the youngest in my generation of the family with the, these strong, capable, older siblings, and she had been the youngest in her generation of the family with these strong, capable siblings, and we, I guess we just had a lot in common, and we were very close through our whole lives. We both had also shared a creative streak deeply overlaid with laziness, <laughs> almost smothering laziness at times. Um, I used to go and visit my aunt every summer in the school vacation to Virginia, and we would get in her rickety little car and ride around to visit other old aunts that we I had up there, and we would talk and cook and eat. That's all we did, but we had a wonderful time doing it. And one summer I went up there, she said, I have thought up a story, and she told it to me. She said, the story is going to be about an old woman who's living alone in her house. So I started thinking about my beloved interior spaces and just what kind of a house it would be. And um, my aunt said this old woman had family that took care of her but didn't really care about her. And she lived in the past. She, she loved her memories of her youth and her childhood and and all her friends of her age were gone and her her pleasure in life was to think about those old days and the old woman got hold of one of those sears and roebuck catalogs you remember those replicas of the sears catalog that came out about 20 or 30 years ago they were um exact replicas of the Sears catalog from the 1890s, and they were fascinating to look at because you could see what kind of stuff people had. Um, you could order from Sears. You could order all these wonderful clothes and um, houses. You could order a whole house from the Sears catalog. You could order a horse and buggy. You could order all kinds of household things and um, they were really a wonderful uh, research tool to see what people had back in those days. But 
In my aunt's story, this old woman had gotten one of these catalogs and had fallen under the misconception that you could actually order things from it. And her children kept finding these letters returned to send her where she tried to order things out of the Sears catalog. And then my aunt was going to have this very difficult turn in the story where it turned from reality to surreality, where the old woman was going to order a horse and buggy from the Sears catalog that actually came. And she, the end of the story was she got in the buggy and rode out of town and was never seen again. <laughs> well, every summer when I went up to see my aunt, I'd say, did you write that story yet? No, no, too busy. She wasn't too busy, she was just too lazy. Because she couldn't figure, I knew she couldn't figure out how to turn from real to surreal, that is a difficult trick. And um, so years went by and I would ask her over and over, have you written that story yet? Nope. Well, about 10 years ago my aunt died and I miss her to this day, but I must say the tears weren't dry before I was sitting down at the typewriter <laughs> writing her story. <clears throat> and I'm going to... Um, it is the one I read from a little while ago, and I'll read the beginning and the end of it. So you will have to read it yourself to see how I manage that twist from the real to the surreal. It's called Return to Cinder. It's the one with the two sisters. Mama, you can't order things out of that catalog, said Emily. She was going through her mother's mail as usual. Several envelopes were addressed to Sears Roebuck and Company and her mother's shaky penmanship stamped return to sender with the pointing hand. Luton had one of these American Beauty top buggies, said Mrs. Nash. She was looking at the ads for horse-drawn carriages in a Sears catalog reprinted from 1909. More than a hundred little special features in the manufacturer go to make this a smoother, handsomer, more stylish, more lasting, and better top buggy than could be had for twice the price. That's absolutely true, she said, squinting at the grainy black and white illustration through a magnifying glass. It was black with stripes and a New York red. It had velvet carpet on the floor and a tufted leather seat. Emily's sister, Lucille, thought they should throw out the Sears catalog. It just encourages her, said Lucille. <laughs> but Emily kept remembering what the woman had told them at the Alzheimer's seminar, seminar, that the old memories were the strongest. And if you could connect the old and the new, you might be able to open up pathways of communication. Emily sat down with her mother and pointed to the cover of the catalog. Mama, look right here where it says, a treasured replica from the archives of history. The catalog isn't real. It's a copy. You can't order things out of it. It is real, said Mrs. Nash. Just look at this. I remember that deep roll on the seat and the nickel dash rail and the anti-rattlers. The ride was just as smooth. Mama, said Emily, but Mrs. Nash had turned to mantel clocks and statues of women and hunting dogs to sit on top of them and wouldn't listen. <laughs> and now, um, I'll read the end. This is the night of the Victorian Christmas. Uh, the, the sister is talking to uh, a vendor at the downtown Christmas, Mr. Zalumis. She's wrong about that buggy, though, said Mr. Zalumis. I saw that buggy going down Dawson Street. Pretty thing, wheels just as high and a little bowed top stretched tight and a little brown and white prancy pony. Was it black, said Emily? Did it have red stripes? Coal black, said Mr. Zalumis, shiny red stripes, brand new, not a scratch on it. So this is the sister who's supposed to be taking care of her mother while her other sister's running the downtown Christmas. She ran back home. Back at home, the front door was wide open. Mrs. Nash was not in her chair. And Ned was awake, standing up in his crib in his droopy drawers, calling, horse, horse. <laughs> Emily picked him up and walked through the rooms of the house, trying to think. It was all her fault. 
She'd never thrown out the Sears catalog. But there wasn't anything she could do about it now, she thought, with Lucille in the middle of Victorian Christmas. She might as well just sit down on the back steps for a while with her ch cheek against the back of Ned's head and listen to the brass band. In the red clay dirt of Snodgrass Alley, she could see the horse tracks going down the middle of the road and the tracks of the narrow wheels on each side dug deep. For a while, the tracks veered from side to side in graceful curves as if the horse had felt frisky with such a light load, seeing the road stretching out so long and straight in front of him. But after a block or two, the track straightened out and ran on down the road, steady and true and out of sight. It's my aunt's story. <laughs> so after going through this book, I've become very humbled, and I, I realize I do not make it up. And I'm indebted to lots of people like you, because I'm sure you all have stories that that could be turned into a book like this, and it's a very valuable thing to have such information. Um, we've got some time. If anyone would like to ask a question or say anything, or you tell a story. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. I'm sure we've all had cooking disasters like that, that when you get a little distance from it, you can see that there is some humor in it. Um, he's talking about a story that I guess was in my first book. My father was a collector of Porsche automobiles, um, and he, he had a series of them, and one of them ended up back in Georgia, and yes, it was on the porch for a while, but <laughs> no longer there. Well, my mother had a very interesting life, and um, she was raised in Thomasville, Georgia, that idyllic land. <laughs> and um, she, but when when she married my father, he was a great adventurer, and they moved, uh, they left home, and they they went to the British Virgin Islands. This was in the 1930s early 30s, and they bought an island for $50, and they built their own house and lived there for several years until, the, until my father had to go to the war. And um, they, they lost that island through some kind of um, bureaucratic misunderstanding, probably on their part, but, um, and then she came back to Thomasville, and, and um, she worked at the Red Cross chapter in her old age, and, uh, and she was a farmer there on her family land. Uh, but you can read a book if you, it's certainly not still in print, but maybe you can find it. Um, uh, the Lion's Paw is one, but the story of my mother and father on that island is called Our Virgin Island. Have you read that? Oh, well, everything I've said is true, isn't it? <laughs> yes. Um, now, we're having some inside conversation here. No, I'll, I'll clear that up because that's interesting. Um, my father was a writer, and he wrote children's books, um, adventure stories for boys back in the 30s and 40s. He really wrote some wonderful books. And one of the books was called The Lion's Paw. My father loved orphans, which is not, not a good sign for his own children. 
<laughs> he wrote wonderful books about orphans, and this book is about these two little orphans who escape from the orphanage and the adventures they have on a boat. Um, it, it really is a wonderful book, and it is now in print again. My father's name is, is Rob White. But now that is also my brother's name, who was a writer also. So there's, there's two Rob Whites. Oh, um, that's such an interesting question. I don't know if y'all could hear it. If I could visit myself as a young writer, what lessons would I give myself? Um, I think I would give myself the same advice I think I gave you to write down things that are of interest to you. I, I remember hearing things as a child that I, I don't remember the details of now, and I wish I did. Um, because that's where your writing comes from, is from things that you remember. And if you don't have a good memory, you need to write them down. I, I sometimes write a little bit, and I get accused by one sister in particular of making things up to make the story better. How do you respond if, if one of your uh, subjects says that? Well, it, it's very helpful if you can call it fiction. Because then when you... <laughs> Then when you make things up, you make it better. Now, it is difficult if you're writing nonfiction to get away with that. So to answer your question, I've turned to fiction. Now I only write fiction. I can do anything I like. <laughs> Well, I think um, I didn't go into that in enough detail, maybe. that I think that it used to be the bank president's office. The bank was downstairs, but the room had been abandoned, and it was just an empty room at that time. But it, I knew it had had a grand use at some time because of the moldings and the um, magnificent outfittings it had. And, you know, I think somebody now lives in that room. Thomasville has fallen into this wonderful trend where people live downtown. And they, um, I, I just love that because you can walk where you want to go. And um, it, it's, I, I'm interested in that. And I, I do believe I was downtown yes, uh, a week or so ago, and I saw a woman coming down those stairs with two dogs. I was dying to ask her if she'd take me up there and let me see, but I didn't have the nerve to do that. I used to hear you all the time on NPR, but I don't hear you. Am I just missing it? No, I'm not doing that as much as I used to. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. That was the, I really did get started writing very short essays on NPR, and I, I had, part of my writing history was in college I had trouble writing things long enough. If I'd be assigned to write a 12-page paper on Flannery O'Connor, I'd say everything I had to know would be five pages long. <laughs> and um, I would do all those things like make the margins real wide. And, <laughs> But um, so the, that radio job was wonderful for me because um, it had to be very short. And that was one thing I was good at was, was um, writing very short. So that, was a, that is just an ideal job for a beginning writer because you can write about any subject just as long as it's under three minutes <laughs> when you read it out loud. Uh, well, I think you uh, sometimes you want 
to be cruel if in, in your fictional work. I mean, if somebody is, if one of your fictional characters is cruel, you, you want to do that. Um, you, you just do have to be um, wary about hurting people's feelings if you have based your character on a real person. And, and your fictional character is a hateful, mean person. You, you, you certainly don't want the person that you took some details from to think that is them. Like with Bob Dixon, I wanted a nice man so he wasn't offended, but um, I would not want anybody. That, that older sister who was kind of the bossy, mean one in the story with all the difficulties, I would certainly not want anybody to think I'd base that character just on her. Yes. How did you meet him and do you continue to uh, be in touch and are still friends? We are. Uh, Daniel Pinkwater is a children's book writer, and um, I taught his, I used his books in my first grade classroom. And then he became a, a commentator on All Things Considered, and, and he helped me to get that job. We are still friends. Oh. That's how it was, yeah. He's a, he's a very interesting children's book writer. I guess I guess we all sense that, but um, I, I, I hope that I don't cling to that Southern identity in a way that um, is not realistic. There, there are certain things I like about the South and certain things, of course, that we don't like, and um, I, I don't like to pretend that I'm proud to be a Southerner just because because it has some kind of appeal that is not real. Well, I think we've just about exhausted the subject, but I thank you so much for coming, and I've enjoyed it. <laughs>